You've tuned into another edition of The Break Room, a weekly conversation about how the city of St. Augustine works from those who do the work every day. Hosted by the city of St. Augustine's communications director, Melissa Whistle, The Break Room offers a closer look at the different city departments and provides updates on current and upcoming projects and events. And now your host, Melissa Whistle. Hello, and thanks for tuning in. You're listening to The Break Room. I'm Melissa Whistle, Communications Director for the City of St. Augustine. This week, I'm going to start by asking you, our listeners, a very important question. Do you ever think about where your tap water comes from? That includes your drinking water, water for your shower, your bath, watering your lawn, flushing your toilet. I would guess that most of us turn on the faucet, and we're fairly confident that not only will the water come out, but that it's going to be clean and drinkable. After all, we live in a modern society, so why wouldn't it be? This week, I've invited one of the City of St. Augustine's water treatment operators, Alex Horton, to join me in the break room to talk about the city's water treatment plant and what it takes to keep our water clean and drinkable. Alex, welcome to the break room. Hey there. Thanks for having me. You've never been on the break room before. Nope, not once. First appearance. Absolutely. And we're going to ask you all the deep, deep questions. Yeah, super excited. So... It's pretty simple. I turn on my faucet, water comes out, I drink it, tastes pretty good, don't really think much about it, but it's not like I'm out in my backyard siphoning in water from from the earth. So where does our water come from? What do you do down there at the water treatment plant? Well, these these are some very good questions because, as you know, most people don't think about where the water comes from. As you mentioned, people go to their sink, they turn on the faucet, they flush their toilets, and that's really the uh, that's really the end of it. And uh, kids especially don't think about where their water comes from or where it goes because their parents pay for the water bill. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so because of that, uh, a very little thought is 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 considered. Well, here in Florida, um, we have several different places where we can get our water from. We do have some places in Florida that get it from uh, surface waters, from, right. from like lakes, rivers, or streams, mm-hmm. but. Uh, but more common in Florida, we get water from the ground. We mm-hmm. we use well water. Um, uh, typically, there are three different uh, depths for the water. You mm-hmm. have your shallow well, you have your intermediate well, and then you have your deeper well, um, where water is primarily pr- a pump from the floor, the Florida aquifer, and that's okay. where we at the city pump ours from at the deeper level. Okay. So we're sucking it in from the earth, basically. Exactly. Okay. And the thing about that is um, from these different levels, you get different levels of purity. Okay. And different uh, minerals are in the water. Like you have um, – uh, basically the earth acts like a giant filter. Okay. On um, the deeper it goes, the uh, the more pure and clean the water is. Okay. So we're pulling ours into a pump? Yes, exactly. Um, the city has about um, about eight pumps. Um, um, uh, we call them wells or, okay. or well, well houses or well, or well pumps. Um, we have about eight of them, and uh, typically most of them are actually really giant uh, pumps. They, they pump over 1,500 gallons a minute, Ooh. and we typically run two or three of those at a time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We do have a couple smaller uh, wells um, that typically p- pump about five or 600 gallons a minute, and we use those to supplement the bigger ones. Okay, so what happens if it's so it's coming into a pump? Does it just come right into our center, our treatment center? That is exactly correct. The water comes in from our well field and comes to the water plant. When it enters the water plant, it basically splits off into two different portions. One of these portions goes into our um, in, into our regular filter building. Now, basically, we just uh, chlorinate the water for disinfection, and then we put it through a filter. Okay. Now, these filters are sand filters. They're, they're very tall, very big filters. They're probably over probably about 10, 10 to 15 feet tall. Okay. Um, these filters have different layers of sand, anthracite, which is like a, uh, like a type of hard coal, and it's got like a gravel underlayment. Okay. And once it's coming through, it's going to go into that chlorination or the sand. And these are the buildings, if, if anybody is familiar with uh, West King Street, they're uh, on the west side of US-1. There's This is the building. If you're heading west, it's going to be on the northwest corner, the water treatment plant. Exactly. Okay. And actually, this building is a historic building. It was actually constructed back in like the early 1900s. Okay. And it was rededicated uh, sometime la- uh, later. I don't know the exact date, but mm-hmm. it's a very historic and old building. Cool. And you get to work in it every yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. So it comes into these filtration systems. Um, it goes through a chemical process. Do we process it? You mentioned the chlorine. Well, uh, yes. Um, historically, um, before um, before um, 
the city used a process called lime softening. Mm-hmm. It's where they would add lime to, to the water and it would raise the pH enough to where all the calcium hardness would precipitate out. Mm-hmm. But with modern te- technology, we've moved away from the lime softening process. And now we use a process called reverse osmosis. Okay. Uh, you might be familiar with the little thing under your sink, the mm-hmm. little tank, right. and, you, and you have the little spout. Right. Um, that's a, a reverse osmosis for your individual house. Now, okay. we do the same thing at the plant, but on like an industrial scale. So do I need a water softener at my house? Well, typically speaking, the water that's given to your home is fine, but it, there are some levels of hardness in it. Some people have things like water softeners to remove some of the hardness because uh, if you let the water sit on your counter, you may notice you get like a like a white film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so get when, that in my coffee fil- in my coffee maker. Exactly, because because <laughs> whenever water dries that has hardness in it, you get that you get that scale. Okay. And then so what the RO does is it gets all of that out. Okay. And then so like typically for like for your house, when you're like you said for your coffee, a little small one's okay. You don't have to get them. The water is safe to drink even right. without one. And I don't, I mean, you and I've talked about this. We have won awards for our water. Yes, in, in the past. I mean, we have good water. Yes, absolutely. So tell me a little bit about, um, I don't think we do this anymore. You and I've talked about this. The um, process that we used to do where we would put out a notice that tells people, uh, you may notice a smell or a discoloration, but the water's fine. We don't do that anymore? No. Um, as of this year, we basically started a new process. Um, historically, the city has disinfected the water with something called chloramines. Uh, chloramines is basically a combination of chlorine and ammonia. Um, what, what that does is it provides a type of residual that does uh, um, inactivate my microorganisms so that way the water is safe to drink. But there's a downside to using chloramines. Um, chloramines introduce nitrate in, into the water, and which could have certain health effects. But also, over time, there is a certain type of bacteria called nitrosomonas and nitrobacter, which actually uh, eat the nitrates. And then what happens is, is your chlorine residual will fall off the mat. It will go to zero. And then so what that happens, um, there is a possibility that pathogens could grow in the water. And so um, ultimately, what we would have to do is do lots of flushing to clear the lines and really waste millions of gallons of water on the ground. And then we would um, end up having to do something called a burnout. But we're not doing that anymore. We're not doing that anymore. Not flushing and wasting water. We're not flushing and wasting water. So that's good for water conservation. That's good. And then, But basically what a burnout is, is just when we use free chlorine. We basically just turn off the ammonia. And then so we did a pilot study to investigate the feasibility of using just free chlorine. I mean, we do it several times a year anyway. Right. And then so the, the pilot study did prove to be a success. Um, we were able to stay within all the DEP regulations for um, like chemical contaminants, and then the water proved to still be safe to drink, even just using free chlorine. Wonderful. So we're saving water and still keeping it safe it, and drinkable. Exactly. And the best part about it is the water quality stays the same. We don't have to issue no, of notices of changes in water. It basically stays the same all year round. Great. If you're just now tuning in, you're listening to The Break Room. This week in studio, we're talking with Alex Horton. He is one of our water treatment operators for the city of St. Augustine. So talking about the water treatment plant itself, how many operators does it take to run this plant? Oh, we have about eight or nine operators. Um, The plant is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And sometimes if there's like a bad hurricane or something like that, sometimes people have to stay there. So we are set up to be full living quarters 24-7. Do we have, do we run the risk of losing power or something happening to our system where it goes into some type of an emergency shutdown? I'm I'm picturing, you know, red flashing lights and buzzers, you know, going off that something has happened and... Yes, that's, that sort of thing does happen. It happens more often than people realize. Because um, what happens is even if there's like a power glitch, you know, or we're out of power, um, we have emergency generators that, that switch over automatically. And when that and when that happens, everything, I mean, everything still runs, but it goes, okay. everything goes haywire. Okay. <laughs> but we don't ever, but we do have backup systems. Oh, absolutely. So that we're going to not run out of good water. Exactly. Uh, and how do we, you've, you and I, again, you and I were talking about this. You have to test the water constantly. 
Yes. Yeah, I, I picture you going in like I have, I used to have a pool and you go in and you drop the little pH dropper in and you sit there with your little tube thing and you, and you compare, is it, is it something on a different scale, like testing the water? How do you do the samples? Now, basically, um, we do have automatic analyzers, but manually, every two hours, we get uh, different samples from different points of treatment. We get a sample right after the initial chlorine enters the filter building. We get a sample of after the filters. We get a sample from where the blended water comes together. And then we also test the, uh, I guess, what would be the first tap. Uh, if the okay. water plant, we're, we're the first customer because we're right there. And we make sure that the water going through the entire treatment process is dis is disinfected properly. And then up to the first customer, um, we can monitor much more closely that, that way. You ever have to go out in town and, and go knock on doors and take samples? Now, what we do with that is every month, we I don't know, the I remember the exact number, but there's about, a, about, about 130 different sample points that we go throughout the city every month. And we test for something called BACTs, which is short for bacteriological sampling. Um, uh, two operators go out in town and they ride around and then they fill up sample bottles, which go to a certified lab. Now and we have a certified we, lab, right? We have okay. a certified lab. So we test our own and we're, we're, we have that capability. We do have the cape. We do have the capability. You guys have had Glaber Skip on here before. Mm -hmm. She's the, uh, environmental coordinator over there. And she is, one of her duties is testing the water and making sure that the back teas are, are tested properly. The, now is that. Is that also part of the wastewater? How do you guys operate or integrate with the wastewater, or do you? Now, the wastewater side, there are they, there is a separate department, but they have similar testings as well. But they have additional testing for something called um, like like E. coli, because that okay. has to do with your you know intestinal bacteria. Right. But we deal with them on a regular basis because I mean, what comes into our water treatment plant goes to them. Okay. So we've got good drinking water. People can get softeners if they want, or I've, I think I've got a filter on my refrigerator, yes. on my water dispenser, but I think that comes standard. <laughs> but I don't have to have it. No, you don't technically have to have it, because um, um, many people with private wells don't have these big elaborate treatment plants. Like uh, like, my, like my parents, they have a five-acre pro property with their own private well. They have a softener to get rid of some of the hardness, but it's just pumped out, out, out of the ground. Because even when we test our raw water, before tre treatment, we do test that for bacteriological samples, and we come up negative all the time. So, I'd love to hear that. Now, just real quick, you're a certified water expert. You have a certification. I mean, this isn't just something you just walk in off the street. I mean, you could be taught how to do it, but you have a certification. Exactly. Every, every, every operator is supposed to be uh, certified and licensed. Now, obviously, you don't start out with, with a license because it takes training. We need contact hours. That's actually hours in the field. There are state tests, which are which are monitored and 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 served by the DEP, which is the uh, or at least our case is the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. They do the testing, and um, operators can and it, well for. For people to get their their license, they they can be hired on as like an operator trainee, or sometimes they have intern pro uh, programs. I know the city allows internships and volunteers to volunteer at the water plant. It's great experience. It's a great field to work in that a lot of people don't think about. And you started as a volunteer as well. Yes, I did. I started out as a volunteer. I had a little bit of experience in the water industry over in the Panhandle, um, over in Jackson County. Okay. But um, after I moved back to St. Augustine. Um, I was wanting to get another job in, in my town. And so there weren't any available. So I went to the human resources department at the city and I asked if I can volunteer. And they told me, hey, come on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And here you are, a full-time employee, one of our operators, expert in your field. Exactly. It was a really good experience. I got to get really good hands-on training. I got to meet people at the city. It, it, it was a really exciting time. Well, we're glad to have you. And hopefully this gives everyone an idea of where their water now comes from. And uh, next time you turn on your faucet, enjoy a nice t taste of fresh, clean drinking water from the city. Absolutely. Thanks for stopping by, Alex. Not a problem. We want to keep you informed about what's happening in and around the city, and most importantly, that you hear it here from the people doing the work and making it happen every day. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. You'll find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at City St. Aug. Until next time, thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to The Break Room, a weekly program addressing projects and programs offered by the City of St. Augustine. 
Join us each week as the city's communications director, Melissa Whistle, has in-depth conversations with the people who make our town work to meet the needs of our community. The Break Room is produced by communications specialist for the city of St. Augustine, Cindy Walker. See you at this time next week for another edition of The Break Room.